we're going to do something a little bit different today. We are going to try and focus on the areas, particularly that are a keen interest to many of us. Gil Troy is a distinguished scholar in North American history at McGill. Uh, he lives in Jerusalem. He's an author of many books, articles, and has recently revised Arthur Hertzberg's book, The Zionist Idea, which I recommend all of you put your hands on. Steve Baim served as the AJC's Director of Contemporary Jewish Life and the Kabbalman Institute Director from 1982 forwards. And he, too, is extraordinarily well-published. Articles, books, commentaries, both of them have spent a lot of time thinking about, <laughs> writing about diaspora-Israel relations, and particularly the areas of overlap between the two communities. What I'd like to do is to focus on particular areas of consensus, of overlap, and then maybe particular areas of distinction. What I'd like to get away from is this constant discussion of areas that divide, areas that divide, areas that divide, or distancing. The danger is the idea of we might be stereotyping either American Jews or Israeli Jews. And we know that there is great diversity within both communities, demographically, ethnically, religiously, where we live. Gil is going to start off talking about areas that unite and those that separate us, uh, but he's really going to focus on roots. What are the roots that uh, may align us? Steve will talk about what is Israeliness. I'm honored to be on a panel with two heroes of mine, two people who have really been so important in shaping the conversation and teaching me so much. So uh, sorry for being a fanboy, but uh, it really is an honor. And it's a pleasure, of course, to see uh, so many happy faces at the continue of this conversation. All of us are on the front lines of building this relationship. And I very much appreciate your opening, Ken, because I too, I'm exhausted by what I call the I-cubed, the Israel indignation industry, the constant oy vain, the oy of Judaism, not the joy of Judaism, the oy of Zionism, and not the joy of Zionism. And I agree with you, we can't stereotype. So let's talk about the 83% of American Jews who say Israel is important to them. And let's talk about over 73% of Israelis who I think it was, you know, Israelis love elections so much. We voted once, twice, three times, four times, now going for a fifth time. And I think in election two, there was a poll which said, is it important for you, Israeli voter, that the prime minister of the state of Israel build diaspora relations? And 73% said yes. Now, it's true when they get to the voting booth, that may not be number one on their list because they're worried about security and they're worried about personalities and they're worried about economy. But both peoples, if you will, because there are differences, and we'll talk about the differences maybe in the next round, the Israeli people and the American Jewish people want to stay connected. And a lot of it goes back to our roots. A lot of it goes back to the fact that we do understand, and we, we don't just need anti-Semites to remind us. We understand that we are a people. We understand that we have a common story. And it's funny, you know, when you sit and talk to Israelis and American Jews, you can emphasize that which divides us. But ask about the parents, the grandparents, the great-grandparents, you're very soon going to get to overlapping stories, overlapping narratives the immigrant narrative, and frankly, unfortunately, the suffering narrative. And the suffering narrative sometimes is in Eastern Europe, and the suffering narrative, of course, can also be in the Muslim and Arab countries. And so we understand instinctively that common past. We have common rituals, and it's a mistake to just emphasize the difference. It's important to say that we do, and also most of us understand that Israel is front and center, not only in modern Jewish identity, but in the entire scope and sweep of Jewish history. I once wrote an article challenging people because one of the problems is we listen too much to the extremists. We listen too much to the negators. We listen too much to the dividers. And so there's all this constant hysteria about how there's this growing divide between American Jewry and Israel. And so there are you know groups of rabbis who say, oh, we don't need Israel anymore. So I said, well, let's do a little exercise. Let's try to go through the Jewish life cycle. Let's try to go through the Jewish calendar year without Israel. You can't have apples and honey on Rosh Hashanah because it comes from Israel. And you can't celebrate Yom Kippur because it's based on the temple and temple rituals and Sukkot and on and on and on and Pesach. And as long as we emphasize what I like to call the Jewish Oreo cookie, understanding that just like the Oreo cookie has a cookie part and the cream part, and that's what makes the Oreo cookie unique and the most popular cookie in the world, and it says it on the internet and everything on the internet is true, so too Israel 
and Judaism are intertwined because Judaism is a nation and a religion. And understanding that, which we see at the Kotel, which we see when we celebrate the Seder, and it goes back to Lech Lecha, is a, an essential part of our common roots. So part of it also is a different emphasis. Yes, of course, we have challenges, and I don't want to minimize them. And I'll be happy to get to them in the next round. But it's also important to celebrate who we are, celebrate where we've come from, celebrate the difference between our current situation and the situation of our people 10 years ago, 50 years ago, 70 years ago, 125 years ago. Right now, we should be preparing for this exciting trajectory. August 28th, 29th, over a thousand of us are going to be in Basel celebrating the 125th anniversary of the Zionist Congress. And think of where we were 126 years ago and 125 years ago and where we are today. Homeless, stateless, without dignity, broken down yids, lost. And now how far we've come. And then November 29th, we're gonna celebrate the 75th anniversary of the world recognizing at the UN, not just the partition plan, but also Jewish statehood which is based on Jewish peoplehood. And then finally, we should be building up to May when we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel. And so this year in particular should be a trajectory of celebration. And in a sense, just to summarize, what am I talking about? Theodor Herzl was all about political Zionism. And of course, we still have to defend the state and perfect the state. But one of the things I've been trying to emphasize for the last two decades really is what I call identity Zionism which is our common roots, our common language, our common past, our common future. And that should be a launching pad, first of all, to find meaning because what's the major challenge in the Jewish world today? I don't believe it's anti-Semitism. I believe it's a search for meaning. I believe it's a search for rootedness. I believe it's a search for connectedness. I believe it's a search for purpose. And I'm not arrogant enough to say that we have the only way to do it, but identity Zionism says we have a very exciting way to do it and we want to invite the next generation, and frankly, this generation, to celebrate, to understand, and to toast L'chaim. Thank you. L'chaim to you, Stephen. You're on. Oh, thank you, Ken. Thank you, Gil. I'm also very, very delighted to be on a panel with both of you. Let me be, just begin with a very quick story. And also, it's, again, it's about stereotypes, and I like to get beyond them. But a good number of years ago, I was at a conference on Israel for relations, and I befriended a reporter for the New York Times who was there on his first visit to Israel. And I asked him, not at the beginning of the conference, but really at the end, I said, what do you make of the society of the country? And he said, I really dislike it. There's too much religion. I sort of understood where he was coming from. Jews tend to talk about religion and politics. And as Ken sort of alluded in his opening remarks, those are often the things that divide us rather than the things that unite us. That said, if we go beyond the stereotypes, and again, as both Ken and Gil have pointed to, there's a great deal of commonality, the story of which does not often get told. A very important recent book was published called Israeli Judaism, Portrait of a Cultural Revolution. The authors are the journalist Shmuel Rosner and Camille Fuchs. The thrust of it is that there is a common Israeliness, if you will, a common Jewish identity that permeates society. That is not a religious identity, as per the New York Times reporter. On the contrary, it's an identity based upon people, culture, a distinctive Jewish ethos, if you will, language, as Gil mentioned, heritage, serving in a Jewish army, living in a Jewish neighborhood. All these things create a common Jewishness that permeates society between secular and religious. If anything, the real change in Israeli society in recent years is that it's become, in many ways, a traditional society as opposed to a religious society. Israel today is center-leaning right. Now, again, that does not mean there are no political differences. On the contrary, American Jewry, as we'll talk about later, is center-leaning left. But a center-right society does not mean that it's governed by religion. And what it does mean is that there is a respect for heritage and tradition, in some respects parallel to the respect for heritage and tradition in the non-Orthodox movements within the United States. It is true, and this is again what gets all the headlines, that about 5% of Israeli society has no interest in Judaic heritage in any shape, manner, or form, no interest in Jewish peoplehood. This gets a good deal of media attention, 
for two reasons. Number one is that it's catchy on the one hand. This is post-Zionism in its most pristine form. And secondly, it's particularly found in the sectors of society that are quite influential, namely the media, the think tanks, the universities. That 5% may be disproportionately influential, but is hardly representative of what I call the common Jewishness within Israeli society as a whole. What's more than that, and this is perhaps this is the more political comment, is that the collapse of Oslo, one of its side effects back in 2000, was that post-Zionism, which had its heyday in the 1990s, essentially left Israeli society and emigrated into universities. And that's, again, a such worthy of attention in its own right. Post-Zionism today, though, is largely marginalized within Israeli society. What it's replaced by is a common discussion of what kind of a Jewish state are we talking about? How does that compare with the American Jewish community? Number one, in both societies, there is a reservoir of a common Jewishness. American Jews like to think that Judaism means something to them. Exactly what it means is going to vary from case to case. But the sense of hostility to Judaic heritage and tradition that, again, you might find in post-Zionism is rarely found in American Jewry at all. What there is in American Jewry's distinctive hallmark is that of pluralism, religious pluralism. In Israel, that is usually translated as anti-clericalism in the sense of opposition to the chief rabbinate and its hold over aspects of personal identity such as marriage and divorce. The forms of pluralism in Israel are not necessarily the American Jewish forms. Um, if anything, they're not the American Jewish forms. But what's fair to say is that the pluralism that does exist in Israel is a desire for different options of what it means to lead a Jewish life, what it means to be a Jew. Thirdly, when we speak of Jewish assimilation in the United States, it's a very serious challenge, as should be obvious to everyone. We're talking about a minority Jewish community as opposed to a majority Jewish society. And this is probably the critical difference between Israel and American Jewry, because when Jews are a minority of the society, the boundary between being a Jew and not being a Jew is incredibly fluid. You know, people move in and out of it with relative speed. In a majority Jewish society, the concept of assimilation means assimilate the Jewish people, become part of the Jewish people. In that sense, we have a divergence in which Israeli society is based upon a collective Jewishness, a collective sense of peoplehood, American Jewry, and this I would say is probably a most critical challenge here, is heavily individualistic in the sense of I choose whether or not I personally want to be a Jew. I can be a Jew, I cannot be a Jew, I can be a member of two faiths. All the options are open here in the United States. What is fair to say, and this goes back to take a more retrospective look over 100 years, is that when Zionism began, again, you'll see this in Gill's book that I also highly recommend, when Zionism began, without question, part of its ethos was formulation, building up of a new Jew, a Jew that had no connection with the Jewish diaspora. We'll build here in Israel a society based upon strength and vigor, as opposed to passivity of the diaspora. That concept of the new Jew as a rejection of the diaspora, and again, in terms of teaching, I recommend this wholeheartedly, a short story by Chaim Chatzatz, simply called The Sermon where the main character, Yudka, standing up, giving a speech at a kibbutz, says, let's get rid of Jewish history. Jewish history is passive. It's nothing glorious. It's shameful. We're building a new society here. Chatzatz is criticizing that. He's satirizing it. He's parroting it. That rejection of the new Jew, I would suggest, has become now central to Israeli society. Few people talk in terms of, we want nothing to do with the diaspora. Knowledge of the diaspora experience, no. We'll talk about that perhaps in the second round. But identification with the Jewish people, I would suggest, has been enhanced in recent years. Very last point. What has Israel meant for American Jews? One thing we should never forget, aside from the political significance of American Jews playing a role in terms of enhancing U.S.-Israel relations, a subject in and of itself, realize that support for Israel, pro-Israel advocacy, has become a vehicle whereby non-Orthodox American Jews can identify with the Jewish people without being religious. In other words, Jewish political advocacy, pro-Israel advocacy, has become a vehicle of preserving American Jewish identity. 
long and short, to go back to my friend, the journalist in New York Times, is that uh, if you're talking about Israel as becoming an Orthodox society, the divergence with the diaspora will be very great because 90% of American Jews are non-Orthodox. But if you're looking at Israel as a, a common thread of peoplehood, a common sense of identity, there's more that binds the two communities together than that separates them. Let's move on, Gil, if you'd like to tackle the status of neighbors and neighborhood and how we both see ourselves geopolitically. Let me just make one or two comments off of Steve's very important analysis. When you talk about Israeliness, right, and you talk about my key takeaway from Rosner's book, the secret is intermarriage. And I love going back when travel was a verb. I loved going to Orthodox synagogues in Beverly Hills or New York and saying, I love intermarriage. What do I mean? In Israel, intermarriage between Ashkenazim and Mizrahim or Sephardim has been one of the keys to breaking out of that old Ashkenazi, let's see, sandwiches on Yom Kippur and on Pesach mentality that was so hostile to religion. And intermarriage in Israel is something that's bringing the society together. Whereas we know that intermarriage in the United States and American Jewry has become a much more complicated topic. Similarly, if we go back to my Oreo cookie, what we see is a kind of false consciousness, if you will, both among your typical Israelis and your typical American Jews. American Jews say my religion is Judaism, although most of them, as Steve was suggesting, are not religious, and most of them aren't necessarily Shemari Shabbat, and not, most of them are not Shemari Kashrut, and they're deeply peoplehood people. Similarly, when you talk to Israelis and you say, oh, all these traditions you do are part of your religion, they say, no, 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 I am secular. And so I say to my secular friends, I say, great, there's a hot new restaurant that just opened up in Tel Aviv. I could only get reservations seven o'clock on Friday night. Will you join me? And they go, I can't go then. I go, why not? They go, my mother will kill me. I go, why? She says, because I have to be there for what? Shabbat dinner. And so what do we have? We have Israelis, many of whom say, oh, I'm not religious, but actually are following what we see as religious traditions. We have Americans who are not religious who are saying, oh, it's my religion, because that's a place where I click on the census form. That is an opportunity for us to cross wires and to teach American Jews how deeply peoplehood oriented they are and Israelis how deeply traditional they are. And that actually connects to the analysis that Steve was talking about that I'm gonna go a little bit more into about this whole, what does it mean to be a minority and a majority? Because it's not just a matter of living in a minority society and living in a majority Jewish society. It's also look at the neighborhoods that we're in. And this is the geopolitical dimension that Ken was mentioning. And so American Jews focus on survival by getting along with their neighbors. And it tends to make them more liberal because many of them, it's not surprising 70, 80% of American Jews are liberal because they say the more liberal our society, the more open, the more tolerant, the more pluralistic, the more they will respect us, the more they will accept us, the less anti-Semitism we believe will be in the society. And of course we have to know that unfortunately in the last 20 years, we've seen a surge of anti-Semitism, not just on the right, but on the far left. And that messes up the paradigm, but fundamentally there's a whole long debate about why American Jews uh, are liberal, but one of the things is part of their survival strategy is believing that we can survive as a minority in a minority friendly country like the United States of America. Israelis, surrounded as they are by hostile forces, although thanks to the Abraham Accords and the peace treaty with Egypt, the peace treaty with Jordan, I argue that we have to call it the Arab Israeli conflicts, not the unending, never ending Arab Israeli conflict and see that things are changing. But nevertheless, living in a hostile neighborhood and focusing on sovereignty, Israel's survival strategy is about staying together as a majority and keeping out the bad guys. And that sometimes leads people to say, oh, American Jews have become a blue state and Israeli Jews have become a red state. We certainly felt this during the Trump era when people said, oh my goodness, how can you Israelis love Trump? And Israelis were saying, how can you American Jews not appreciate that Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem, et cetera, et cetera. So there are tensions. When Natan Sharansky and I wrote our book, Never Alone, and what was the message? That we can't just be about never again. We can't just be about Holocaust guilt. We have to know that when you're a part of the Jewish people, you could be in the Gulag, you could be in Montreal, you could be in Miami, you could be in Beverly Hills, you could be in Tel Aviv. You're never alone. You're part of this amazing people. And that's something to celebrate. We also talked about how Israeli Jews increasingly seem to be Davidian, like King David, focused on survival, focused on sovereignty. And American Jews seem to be increasingly Isaiah focusing on these lovely liberal values. 
But then we flipped it around and said, don't overemphasize the differences. Because if you read about King David, you also see that he was a psalmist and he was a harpist. And he also had that soft, quote unquote, liberal side. And when you read all of Isaiah, you see Isaiah was also about patriotism and nationalism and not just universalism and understand that the best way to be a universalist, the best way to achieve a tikkun olam is through our particularism. So ultimately, the message is that, yes, we have emphases that are different. And we have to actually maybe even learn. Maybe American Jews can learn a little bit of patriotism, of communalism, of connectedness from Israel. Maybe Israeli Jews can learn a little bit more about civil liberties and individualism and pluralism and tolerance from American Jews. So we emphasize those differences in the headlines and we emphasize those differences on every panel. But I also like to celebrate the underlying messages that unite us. And part of that really is understanding that it goes back to the Torah, but it continues through the Zionist revolution. We understand as Jews that the best way to save the world is first save ourselves. And the best way to reach out to others is first have pride and have a spine and stand tall like those new Jews that have already been mentioned. Jews in the diaspora will always be a minority. We're never going to change that demographic reality. And Israelis in the Middle East will always be a minority in their neighborhood. So that the chromosome of minority-ness, if mm. I can use that term, is going to be part of us who we are well into the future. And one of the ways that we have coped with it in both places is that we've learned to reach out to others in order to secure our tomorrow. It's assuring us that we go from kiddish to kiddish with not too much Kaddish in between. Hmm. Steve, you indicated a desire to talk a little bit about historical memory. Does historical memory exist sufficiently or differently in both societies and how so? The dominant historical memory, I would say both in Israel and in America, specifically among non-Orthodox Jews, is the memory of the Holocaust. And that's an interesting development in and of itself. We're really talking really about the last 10, 20 years at the most. That is a statement on the one hand that for Israel, Yad Vashem, if you will, has become the national shrine. It's interesting, it's even an uptick apparently in Haredim and ultra-Orthodox attending Yad Vashem. But for years, for decades, Yad Vashem was the place of pilgrimage, if you will, on the ninth of Av among secular Israelis. For American Jews, no course on the college campus attracts anywhere near the number of students who enroll in courses on the Holocaust. I think UCLA a number of years ago discovered that if you set aside Hebrew language courses, more students enrolled in a course on the Holocaust than in all of the Judaic studies courses combined. That goes back about 10 years, whether it's still true today, I don't know. But it's a statement that there is a common historical memory based on the idea of we are the next generation after the Holocaust. Is this good or bad? I'd suggest to you it's very much a mixed bag. On the one hand, there's no avoiding it because it's the dominant event of our time. On the other hand, it dwarfs all other historical memories. You talk for a second simply about 20th century Jewish history. Yes, there are two major seminal events, the Holocaust and the creation of the state of Israel both of them of worldwide cosmic significance. The comparison of degree of understanding of the Holocaust and knowledge of it far dwarfs the intricacies of what went into the creation of the state of Israel. If you're looking at history as a vehicle of building connections, peoplehood, a sense of identity, would you really want to construct that identity upon a story of Jewish catastrophe. A good number of years ago, I was taking a group of American Jewish academics to Israel who were considered to be under-affiliated. They were not completely unaffiliated, but nor were they completely identified. Went around the room asking, what does it mean to you to be a Jew? The answer almost universally among 22 people was terrible things happen to Jews. That's been the impact of Holocaust memory, that it's created an image of what is it to be a Jew to be ever suffering. I also think that the price being paid here is that the message to the outside world is that Jews in and of themselves have nothing to contribute. The role of the Jews in civilization, if you will, is to be the recipients of persecution and oppression. Spinoza put this very well a couple of hundred years ago, namely that the reason for Jewish survival is that the Gentile world didn't let the Jews alone. Well, that's a terrible reason to keep a people going. 
And that's, I think, is what the challenge is today, is that we do have a common history. That common history suffers from two major deficiencies. Among Israelis, there was a fascination with archaeology back in the 1950s because it proved the historicity of Jewish settlement in Palestine. At the same time, the view of Jewish history in the diaspora was basically non-existent, except to say that Jewish life in the diaspora was bankrupt. For American Jews, the dominant historical memory to the extent that there was one, aside from the Holocaust, was this notion of Chaim Solomon, that Jews were here at the beginnings of America. What they were doing was never understood or never fathomed. The real narrative of American Jewry is an incredible success narrative, namely that the Jews came here, they acculturated very quickly, they bought into the American dream, and they were perhaps the most successful in acculturating to that dream, and at the same time built a Jewish communal network of institutions that are the envy of every non-Jewish grouping inside American society. So in this respect, we have a glorious history on both sides, yet that glorious history has been subordinated to a tale of Jewish persecution. I suggest looking ahead in terms of where we are, that not only is Jewish history a vehicle of formulating peoplehood, it's also a vehicle of understanding what it is that the Jews are surviving for. And in that respect, as long as we teach a history that is, we are not agents so much as recipients of oppression, we'll never understand what we're here for. The rabbis had this right 2,000 years ago when they argued only by virtue of their Torah do the Jews survive. We effectively have reversed that and said, we've survived because we have a memory of persecution. The memory is the dominant common one between Israel and American Jewish society. Having said that, both societies face a common challenge in understanding the real contours, the real story of the Jewish experience. Very last point, precisely because we've moved beyond the archeology span of the 1950s and the Chaim Solomon view of early American Jewry, what that really means is that we're not teaching mythic history, and that's positive. Too many myths have prevailed over the years. If we get into concrete history, we understand the real meaning of peoplehood, the ties and tensions between the world's two largest Jewish communities. But that, I think, is really the challenge for the future and where we go from here. It's a very interesting discussion of memory. And if you scratch any one of us deeply, four or five generations back, you'll find probably some ancestor who's from the Eastern Mediterranean or someone from Eastern and Western Europe. And you'll find that that's a commonality. And the other part of memory is, and this is really just a, a plug, one of the thoughts about putting the Center for Israel Education together was to have people go back in time to see how these two large communities evolved and how they went their separate paths. And now they are back again entwined. And Teaching it, understanding it, absorbing it, owning it, belonging to it is all part of this whole idea of let's go back to what Gil started off with as our roots. Gil, you've said that you'd like to make some comments about sociology slash pluralism, immigrant acceptance. Why are we both immigrant societies and how we are just a little bit different in our experiences since we came to our respective places? There are two things that really unite America and Israel. One is that they're both immigrant societies. They're societies in the process of becoming the societies that e pluribus unum, one emerges out of many. But they also are what I call not democracies, but dreamocracies. Societies built around an idea. Society built around an ideal. Now, slightly different ideas, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, to be a free people in our homeland. But they also overlap. And to understand the power of those ideas as drawing immigrants is very, very important. So that's what unites us. Now, there are two problems here, though. One is I call this the dueling promised land problem, because in the heart of every American Jew is indeed that story that Steve talks about. But before we get to the story of American Jewish success, once we arrived on the soil of America, the holy free soil of America, it was an historic movement from the old world to the new world. And even among my American historian friends who no matter how woke they might be, no matter how critical of America they might be, fundamentally in their programming, they believe that this is the new world and the whole world is moving from the old world to the new world. And what's the Zionist story? From the diaspora, the dispersion, to the promised land. America is the promised land. 
in the American Jewish story, in the American Jewish narrative, and Israel is the promised land in, of course, the biblical narrative and the modern Zionist narrative. And so at the heart of the most positive, I love Israel, American Jew, is this tension. And that's another dimension. A third dimension we have to think about when we talk about the sociology is the fact that modern American Jews overwhelmingly are still telling the story of coming over on the boat. And that means that they're fourth, sometimes even fifth generation Americans. And they're so deeply American. Now, one of the exciting things that I think is happening in American Jewry is we're starting to hear from Russian Jews, and we're starting to hear from South American Jews, and we're starting to hear from South African Jews, and we're starting to hear from Israelis. And they have a different story to tell, and they often have a deep instinct for peoplehood. But one of the things that's happening with the newest generation of American Jews is that after all these years of being deeply Americanized and living in really the second most welcoming place in the world, short of Israel, those antenna that we have against danger and that instinctive peoplehood sense we have of how to survive is being somewhat diminished, if not neutralized, and that's a serious challenge. The immigrant door still is pretty wide open as far as Israel's concerned. We still have a dynamism of people coming. I mean, Ukraine is the last one. In America, it seems to have slowed down. I think even the Yordim, even Jews who came from Israel, are less in number than they used to be. But the immigrant experience for the state of Israel still adds a measure of absorption. Let's take care of them. Let's bring them in. The Billy Martin adage in baseball, get them on, get them over, get them in. That was truly what Israel is still about. Steve, you indicated a desire to tackle a very small topic on who is a Jew, the natural point of contrast between Israelis and Americans and how it's perceived and how it's defined. Look, we do have a problem of who is a Jew and two different levels. One level is the obvious one, namely the absence of any common rules of entry into the Jewish people, meaning that in America, there are multiple forms of conversion to Judaism available and accessible. In Israel, there's a monopoly of the chief rabbinate. Uh, to be fair, by the way, it's not exactly a monopoly of the chief rabbinate because technically anyone can convert. The issue is, uh, will the conversion be recognized mm -hmm. for purposes of marriage? So on the one hand, the issue of who is a Jew presents enormous tension between Israel and American Jewry, and that's what's dominated the headlines over this, really for decades at this point. But there's a second problem that I think is perhaps underlying it, or is more of a root problem, and that is that very few people don't want to be Jewish. If anything, one of the more interesting dimensions of recent history is that being Jewish has become popular and something that's desirable. American Jews happen to be the most admired group within American society as a whole. The issue is that peoplehood warrants some demands, some claims upon you. In other words, for people to be taken seriously, it needs to be able to speak a language of norms, values, commitments, expectations, even demands. We've reached a point where that kind of language has become so politically incorrect that it's difficult for the concept of peoplehood to have much meaning, except for this vague sense of, yes, I think I'm Jewish, I have a cousin who's Orthodox. I think the challenge going forward, on the one hand, in the concrete sense, is that, yes, we do need things like common rules of conversion that one needs to convert to something, if you will. Those can be much more liberal than currently, but the absence of any commonality means, yes, there's a real problem specifically and personally over who is a Jew. But the larger question is that if you're asking what peoplehood means, it needs to be able to speak a language of these are commitments that we expect of you. The same way to be an American means an expectation that, yes, I'm going to be a dutiful citizen on a whole host of areas. Within the Jewish body politic, We've lost that sense. And I think that's a challenge going forward. Gil, any final remarks? I think what we really need is what I call the jujitsu, J-E-W. Going back to even what Steve was saying about the Shoah, I think we need to take the negative and turn it to the positive. And that's why it was important for me to emphasize these three key dates coming up of August 28th, 29th, 125th anniversary, November 29th, and May 14th, or, you know, Yom Atzimut. Because I think we really need to use this year to reframe, to celebrate, and to tell a more positive story. And we have these three excellent dates because we live in this base 10 culture to really use this as an opportunity to tell a story about Israel, which isn't just about politics and isn't just about headaches and isn't just about headlines and tell a story about Israel diaspora relations, which isn't just about politics, isn't just about headaches and isn't just about headlines. Stephen? 
I think the real challenge in terms of ed educators is to what extent are we trying to educate for literacy and knowledge, as important as that is, and to what extent are we trying to educate towards identification, nurturing, affiliation. I think it's very positive, as I indicated, that the story of Israel is no longer a mythic story, that we're beyond the mythology of the 1950s. We haven't replaced it as yet, but with a sense of what is the narrative that allows Israel to become really the story of the return of the Jews to sovereignty and statehood as the most remarkable story of the last 2,000 years of Jewish history. In other words, what I'm pointing to is that in our desire to smash myths, which is perfectly understandable from the perspective of historical literacy, we haven't replaced it with a sense of why is this whole enterprise significant? And there's an incredibly heroic narrative to speak about, namely the Jews have gone from people without sovereignty or statehood to being an agent back again in history, an opportunity to show the world, if you will, what the meaning of a Jewish state might be. That's why I think as educators is our responsibility both on the literacy side as well as the nurturing affiliation side. Please define the difference between recipients of oppression and persecution. That's an interesting formulation there. That the Jews have been persecuted as a people over 2,000 years is, again, one of these myths. Jewish history is much more diverse than persecution. The persecution is often meant second-class status. It do not necessarily mean pogroms, which are actually fewer and far between than people think. But yes, persecution, second-class status, was basically the rule of thumb really up until the French Revolution of 1789. Oppression, really, I would suggest, is much more an active form of actual violence against Jews. That obviously, again, it may be our dominant historical memory that that is the most recent chapter of the worst crime in, in all the annals of history. My point was, when you're looking at a historical experience of 3,000 years, it doesn't make all that much sense to view it through the lens of an experience that lasted for 12 years. What I was pointing to is that we've allowed those 12 years to become the prism by which we view the entire Jewish experience. The real entire Jewish experience is much more diverse, much richer than the story of persecution and oppression. I think that's the distinction between the two, but it's also the challenge of where we need to go.